You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Now this week's guest tells me that the number one source of anxiety is chronic play deprivation. We need to play more. We need to have more fun. We need to get outside and throw balls around and stuff. So I will give you the full intro to him in a moment, the full down low as to what you can expect this week. Before I do that, if you are over at anxietypodcast.com, you'll see on the journal tab, the journal pre-sale is underway. You can order a copy of the journal. There's free shipping for it in North America. Uh, it's also a discounted price. So you can get your hands on one of the first edition journals. Um, I'm so excited that these books are going to be coming out really soon. So you can pick one up and as soon as they're ready, they'll be shipped out to you in the not too distant future. Also, while you're on there, if you are interested in working with me one-on-one, there is a tab called Coaching. You can click on that and have a read through. This is essentially an area where I you get to work with me one-on-one. I talk about your specific situation with you on a regular basis, um, and we work through things, and we get into a lot of detail. There's homework to take away. There's challenges to overcome. Um, it's a pretty intensive process, but the people who partake in it certainly see big benefits. So if that's something where you want to get stuck in and you want to get to the bottom of this quicker, then check out the coaching tab, scroll to the bottom and pick a time that works for you and we can jump on the phone and talk about it and see if there's a fit. And if there is, we can we can get things rolling. Um, if you want to start a bit more gently, there's also the online course. So you'll see the tab for that. You can find out more and that's a five week course where you can start self-study basically. So each week you'll get a new video. You can work through those. And again, loads of had loads of great feedback from people, um, including a, a very recent review I just got in terms of uh, somebody who's just been through it and really found a lot of benefit in there. So have a look at that. Any questions, head on over to the contact page where you will see my email address or a box for you to fill in and send me your message directly. Okay, this week's guest is Charlie Hone. Um, Charlie has written a book. He's the author of a book called Play It Away, A Workaholic's Cure for Anxiety. And as Charlie will go on to tell us, he worked for um, Tim Ferriss, the author of The 4-Hour Workweek, um, a book that kind of kicked off a lot of uh, the way I lived my life many years ago. Um, And Charlie worked for him and eventually kind of got burnt out. And anxiety was a part of his suffering, really, a part of what he struggled with most and what he then worked hard at to overcome and play and fun and recreation was a big part of that for him. So it's an angle that we haven't covered in a big way on the Anxiety Podcast. So I'm super excited to get into that in more detail with him today. So without further ado, let's talk to Charlie. Here we go. Okay, so Charlie Hohen, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thank you, Tim. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, very excited to have you. Um, I'm not sure if you remember, we we kind of touched base probably soon after I started the podcast, like eight months ago, and I think you were on the road um, doing some talking at that time, and, and so we didn't connect. But luckily now we've got you on, and uh, I know you have a, a fabulous story to tell. I've kind of consumed bits of it, including your book and TED Talks and a variety of online stuff. You do a, you do a very good job of... Uh, making your things visible online. So um, it's great to have you on. Oh, thank you so much. That means a lot. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So for the people who haven't been online since 1999, um, perhaps you could uh, start off by giving us your background um, in terms of, you know, your your story with anxiety, ultimately. Yeah. Um, so I never intended to be an anxiety expert. I, I, I don't think anybody really does in, in this, uh, but I, I, I was working in uh, a high profile job uh, for, for a few years and things went really well. I was working with uh, the guy who wrote the four hour work week, Tim Ferriss. And um, I just burned myself out. I, I was good at my job. Um, I asked for more responsibilities and I kind of found myself working all the time and, uh, being congratulated by every, everyone in my peer group 
for it. You know, the, the culture of working around the clock is really prevalent in San Francisco, Silicon mm-hmm. Valley, you know, the tech scene. Yeah. And it's really prevalent in freelancers. I found is, is, uh, people hustling to, you know, make, make their business work and, uh, they work around the clock and no one really regulates them. And, uh, I, I found myself that in that position and I was, um, you know, drinking four to five cups of coffee a day. I was taking modafinil, which is like, uh, Adderall if Adderall was on Adderall. Mm -hmm. And, um, anyway, I, I just kind of, I, I burned myself out. I took a few months off and, uh, for the first time was really struggling with anxiety Um, I went back into another job. I did well at that job for several months. And then I had to quit that one because it was still really burned out. And I spent a year uh, just really struggling with debilitating anxiety symptoms. So the classic ones are like uh, a pounding heart that's so loud you can hear it. And uh, you're convinced, you know, you're having a heart attack. Um, you know, having difficulty swallowing, uh, tightness in the chest, tightness in the stomach, um, and uh, just chronic nonstop worrying, uh, and, and just taking those worries so seriously, you know, being convinced I was going crazy, that I was going to die started having panic attacks in, uh, in my apartment, (laughs) which by the way, it's, Like I can say all this now very comfortably and not have any issue, but it's funny because every time I start describing this stuff in a talk or an interview, my girlfriend like, please stop talking about this. This is so Mm -hmm. depressing. Um, But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just that's the way it was. And I I remember being really ashamed of it and uh, in being really frustrated because, you know, when you're in that state, you, you're, you're worrying ironically is addictive because you think it's the only thing that's keeping you alive. It's the only thing that's helping you survive is being on edge, you know? So I was, it it was manifesting in me, you know, doing tons of research, being obsessed with the economy all of a sudden and economic breakdown and natural disasters and, uh, and you know, I, I went to my doctor and I asked, I, I described the symptoms because at this, at this time I didn't really, still didn't really know what it was, but I knew I'd had a panic attack and, uh, my doctor gave me some pills and, uh, like 30, 30 pills of, uh, of a benzo. And I went back and I looked up the symptoms and I, I researched the symptoms for like a half hour or sorry, the side effects for a mm. half hour. And, and so many people were like, I'm addicted to this. It stopped working after the first couple of weeks. Um, and the side effects on Wikipedia were like seizures, psychosis, anxiety, insomnia, and, uh, so I, I decided I, you know, I probably got myself into this condition somehow I can get myself out. So I threw away the pills and, uh, I spent the next several months just trying everything, uh, you know, deep breathing, yoga, meditation, therapy, journaling, Um, I, I tried every supplement you can list. I was doing hardcore exercise, long runs. Uh, I had a super clean diet and I was testing all sorts of different diets. I was, uh, taking, I I took psychedelic drugs. Um, you know, I, I, anything you can list, you know, I was doing flotation tanks, acupuncture, seeing healers, you know, anything you can think of. Um, I did, I did it pretty much. You know, it sounds like, uh, it's almost like you took on overcoming anxiety, like a project you were working on. Like you, right. that was it, right? Yeah. Yeah. In secrecy. And I was, I, I, I tried everything. It felt like, and I remember my, my girlfriend at the time said to me, she's like, 
uh, Charlie, you know, what is, what is wrong? Like what happened to you? You're not the guy that I met all those months ago. And I said, uh, it was the first time I'd said anything to anybody. I said, I feel dead inside all the time. And I, I have no idea how to fix it. And, uh, and she started crying and I remember, um, you know, being envious when she started crying because I was like, I, I feel like I'm on the verge of doing that all the time, but I can't do it. Mm. And, um, yeah, that's, that period just went on for a long time. You know, I lost, I lost those jobs. I lost, um, you know, I lost my girlfriend. I lost, uh, a lot of opportunities. You know, I was, I was invited to go work down in the Caribbean for a couple of months running, uh, you know, a political, uh, teams, social media, like a very, at that, at that point in my life, I like, you know, a job that's like just kind of handed to me. That's super easy for me. Um, and would have been great and probably a really fun experience. And, uh, you know, there was just stuff like that, that I, I look back on and I'm like, I miss so much because I didn't, um, I didn't have my life in order. Mm. You know, this, this, there was, um, you know, when my girlfriend and I broke up a couple of months later, I, I was introduced to another great, woman by a friend of mine. And, uh, I was just blown away. I was smitten, but she was so weirded out. And she told me years later after reading my book, she was like, you know, I was so like not put off by your energy, but like, it made me so like hesitant to like, you know, cause we went on one or two dates and it just didn't, didn't work out. And, um, and I just thought, man, you know, like there's so many things if I'd had my life in order um, or if I wasn't, if I hadn't driven myself into that state that I could have had. Um, so that's, that's kind of the backstory of how that period was. And then what, what happened was um, I kind of resolved that, or, or I'd kind of come to the conclusion that, Hey, maybe life is just going to be like this forever. Uh, and life's just going to be a miserable grind. Um, and then I was over at my, uh, my friend Tucker Max's, uh, apartment and I was looking through his bookshelf and I came across this book called play by Stuart Brown. And at this time I'd read every, how to get over anxiety book. You know, uh, I'd read dozens of them, uh, but this was a book uh, just on creativity, basically, and how humans evolved with play. And I read that book in one sitting, and that was the book that shined a light that, it, that for the first time I was like, oh, my God, this is the answer. Like I started laughing, mm -hmm. uh, partway through the book because I was like, this is why I'm so anxious is because I've chronically deprived myself of play. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, I never went to the gym to run on the treadmill for 30 minutes. When I was a kid, you know, when I was a kid, I wouldn't go sit around drinking coffee and trying to impress another business person. Uh, I wouldn't go to networking events. You know, I, I wouldn't stay up until four in the morning doing work. I was always just playing games with my friends and making jokes and, and pulling pranks and, and having fun, having guilt-free fun in everything that I did. And I realized, you know, I deprived myself of play of, of these things that I'd always turned to growing up, whether it was, playing catch, you know, playing baseball, home run derby, um, creating art, uh, building things with my hands. Um, you know, I was a big practical joker growing up. I just hadn't done these things in so long. I'd become isolated mm. from the anxiety, socially isolated. And any time that I was having fun, I was worrying, you know, I wouldn't allow myself to actually be present 
And the other problems were I was, I was mostly physically inactive. You know, it, it was sitting around working on a laptop all the time. And if you put a hidden camera up on my face, um, it would have shown that I was probably smiling or laughing, you know, a couple of times a day. Mm. And it's like, if you, if you limit your interactions with human beings to screens, yeah, (laughs) that happens. It's Um, not not the laptop lifestyle, living the dream. No, no, I don't (laughs) think so. I mean, it's really challenging. You have to, you have to really be proactive about creating a social life outside of, of whatever it is that you do on the laptop. Right. Mm. Because it's like, I mean, that's why everybody, you know, not only should you join a co-working space if you're a freelancer, but you should make a point to talk to a few people every day while you're there and, and get to know them and take breaks with them, go on, go to lunch with them. You know, humans really need social bonding. They, it, it can't just be, and, and, and this is the other thing was a lot of my socializing was very, you know, I wasn't a total recluse, but, uh, I was, I, a lot of my social activities were very surface level. You know, you know how, when you catch up with a friend for an hour, you just kind of say the same thing, no matter what, if Mm. you catch up with them for an hour every month, you're just kind of having the same conversations. But once that conversation kind of exhausts itself and runs out, then you kind of hit that lull finally where you're both like comfortable being around each other and you can be back in the moment. You're not just catching up on what you've been doing, but you're in the present. And that's really important. It's friendship, right? Yeah. I feel like probably at that time in your life, similar to me when I was in IT sales, so not a million miles away, but I would have never sat down with somebody for lunch and said, you know, Charlie, I'm actually, I'm not good. I'm not feeling well. And right. uh, I'm suffering with panic attacks because um, I've, in some of the stuff that you've written, I've read, uh, I believe similar things, which is for me, I was just trying to like keep it a secret and fix it at the same time, which, you know. Uh, is almost impossible <laughs> to right. to never disclose it whilst also trying to get rid of it because that's what's feeding it, right? Right. And why did you keep it a secret, Tim? Um, for me at the time, it was just I didn't know what was wrong with me. I didn't know how to fix it. I was ashamed. I was extremely hard on myself. I felt like I was broken. Um, all of those things were were kind of going on in my head. And I was also the vice president of a sales team. So I felt like I had this overarching responsibility to show up and be the man. And meanwhile, inside I was like melting. Right. Uh, What uh, were you ashamed of? Um, I don't, I don't know if I'd really resolved it at that point. Um, that's a good question. I think it was just the fact that I couldn't hold everything together and, um, much like with your story, everybody was looking at me saying, you should be fine. Like why your life right. is great. You have a beautiful wife. You've got a good job. You've got an, you know, more than enough money. What's the problem? <laughs> but for somebody yeah. who's struggling with anxiety, as everybody listening to this knows, even if you have your needs met, uh, the, the, there's not always a logical answer to, this, to right. this issue when you're in the midst of it. So yeah, now lots of work later and lots of time later and lots of, um, lots of basically accepting it, embracing it and, and not trying to hide it or fight it. Um, you know, we're a lot further down the line, you know, but at the time, um, that certainly drove it. And I speak to a lot of people who are business executives, um, or people in, in this kind of fields we were in. And, uh, you know, a lot of the time that first question is how do I get rid of this without anybody ever finding out? (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, there's, um, you know, there's, there's tons of reasons behind it. Everything from, you know, the culture that we grew up in of like, uh, you know, men, men aren't allowed to be, uh, you know, don't be a pussy, tough it out, man up Mm. sort of thing. Um, but there's, there's also like the, the inner fear that something might be really wrong 
Yeah. And uh, I might actually be and, crazy. I might right. actually be crazy. Yeah. And I might end up in a, uh, you know, I might be sent to the hospital, uh, to a mental rehabilitation center. Mm. Um, there's, there's that fear. And, and honestly, honest to God, um, you know, I'm always reserved to say this, but, um, it's the truth, you know, to like at, at the very worst that I was, I was in a nutritional deficit. Um, I was socially inactive, physically, mostly inactive and just kind of spinning in my own head all day. Mm -hmm. And some of the symptoms I had were of serious mental illness. And the reality is, is like, if, um, you know, I, I, I liken it to like how prisoners are, right? Which is the government tortures prisoners of war by restricting their social life, their, by mm. restricting their physical movement, by not giving them proper nutrition intake and, and all this stuff. Um, sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Those are the four. I was, I was trying to remember that. So thank you. Those are the four main ones. And in prisoners though, the difference between prisoners is uh, in people who are mentally ill is prisoners know that they're being tortured. Mm. People with mental illness don't realize that they're often inflicting those, uh, those illnesses on themselves. Like that they're creating the environment that is a breeding ground for mental illness and parents do it to their own children. And this isn't like a moral judgment, but it's a fact like parents will restrict their kids from free play and free play is one of the most important things to our mental health because humans have some of the biggest, most complex brains of any mammal on the planet and we play more than any mammal on the planet. We play nonstop in, in, in from, from a very early age, right? It's undeniable. Uh, we, this is how we learn. It's how we safely bond. It's how we explore our environment. It's how we come to understand risk. And when you deprive Humans of play. I mean, they've done it to, in in tests. They've deprived other mammals of play, mm. whether it was chimps or lab rats. And over and over, uh, those those mammals grow up to be socially and emotionally crippled, and they develop these mental illnesses. And that's, I mean, I, I mentioned Peter Gray at the beginning of this of uh, this conversation. Um, that you and I had, Tim, he, he talks a lot about that. A lot of his research is in that area. But one of the things that I learned from Stuart Brown's book in play, he started researching play because he was brought in, um, after the, uh, Texas tower shooter, the government hired him to figure out what he had in common with other serial killers so that they could figure out what it is uh, that that all these guys have in common, so it, it, to hope hopefully prevent these sorts of things in the future. And what one of the things Stuart Brown noticed was that he'd had a severe uh, deprivation of play as he was growing up. His father was hugely restrictive uh, in in constantly making him perform. Uh, like, you know, he, he would have to play piano in front of you know, all uh, guests and stuff. And he could never develop his own self-direction, his own sense of self. And play is what gives us that. All of us, every single human being has that sense of self if they've, if they've played, if they've been left to their own, in, own devices to kind of explore and have their own fun. And if anybody can tap into that and the most useful thing from that book uh, that I found was um, the, the play history exercise, which for anybody who's listening, you can do this right now. Just take out a piece of paper and write down all the activities that you remember 
uh, doing when you were growing up, when no one was judging you, no one was, you know, paying you to do them or you weren't being forced to do them. Uh, and you were just doing them because it was enjoyable. It was fun. And, and it became something that you were good at probably. Um, and like I mentioned for me, that was playing catch. It was, uh, home run derby. It was, uh, organizing things. Uh, it was putting things together, um, with my hands and it was practical jokes. You know, I, 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 Oh, in, uh, filming sketches with my friends. So one of the things that really helped me, um, in, in overcoming anxiety was, signing up for improv lessons and taking those and getting around people and committing to three hours a week, uh, to be around people where I could be vulnerable, where I could be totally goofy. Um, and we would just get together for the sole purpose of playing, you know, and that's, that's what I tell to, I mean, you, you talk to a lot of these business execs, Um, that's what I tell all these business people is that, um, if, if you want to add play into your life and you're like, how do I do it? I, I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't have any friends who are like into that sort of thing, which I think is BS by the way. Uh, Mm -hmm. everybody likes having fun. Um, but if, if you don't have anybody in your life, pay to play, like sign up for a committed group that's dedicated to having guilt-free fun where you can bond with each other, where you can get into a flow state where it's mentally stimulating and there's a lot of joy and laughter. Um, there's, there's plenty of stuff that you can do, whether it's signing up for ultimate Frisbee or signing up for improv or whatever. Um, and, and by the way, I think improv for those business execs, improv I've found is, is one of the top, uh, skills, um, that, or top activities that the top salesmen I've ever met have practiced. Mm. Uh, there's a guy named Ryan Serhant, who's the number one real estate salesman in New York city. Uh, so arguably, you know, one the top real estate agent in the world, right. Or one of the top. And, um, he says, I, for my team, I don't put them through any training. We just do improv because improv boosts your bottom line. Like improv is how to sell. Mm. It's how to connect. And, uh, it's super fun and it'll, it'll help with any social anxiety that you have. It's counterintuitive because improv sounds terrifying to somebody with anxiety, but I mean, try it. What do you have to lose? Yeah. And I was going to say like, uh, one of the other things, and I'm, I'm sure, um, you would resonate with this as well is that, um, the other thing about improv, I think is beneficial for an anxiety sufferer is that many of the anxiety sufferers I speak to and, and I've come across are extremely, attached to the outcome um yeah. so people like to know what time we go into dinner and what's happening tomorrow and who am i going to be safe and who am i with and schedule 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 and uh you know one of the beautiful things about improv is that you don't know what's going to happen next and that is right. so liberating once you embrace it um but also i think that can cross over into our lives most of the Most of the power that you have in your life is when you don't need something. Think about a relationship. Think about a job offer. Think about a house you're trying to get. If you have the ability to say, I don't need that, I'm not attached to it, I'm not attached to it happening a certain way, you're the most powerful person in the world, and improv must must do nothing else but build that muscle. Absolutely. 100% right. I remember actually uh, Tim, one of the most valuable, uh, Tim Ferriss, one of the most valuable lessons he the taught other me. Great was, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is, is he who uh, says no uh, wins or uh, like it was something to that effect, which was uh, he who, no, it was he who cares less wins when mm-hmm. it comes to negotiations. 
Um, but yeah, about improv, it, it kind of inoculates you against the fear of failure, yeah. uh, against the fear of looking stupid, uh, and messing up. And I think that's so important for anxious people is they, you know, you're so serious all the time. You're so mm-hmm. worried about looking dumb and, and, and all this stuff. And you're so wrapped up in your own thoughts. Like this is, <sighs> This so is the thing that yeah. that is so frustrating. It's like you don't you don't actually observe your thoughts. You you are invest your your thoughts are everything to you. But if you do improv, you realize that oh, thoughts are just things. That, you know, they're they're just noises that come up in my head. They're a thing. Uh, there's no such thing as right or wrong. Um, I can play with those thoughts. I can make them silly and stupid and laugh at them instead of being afraid of them, instead of trying to control them and only have the right thoughts to, to resist the bad thoughts, the ones that are, oh, I'm going crazy. Oh, I'm going to die. I'm having a heart attack. Like if you can laugh at those thoughts, the anxiety will go away. But it takes practice. And mm. so I think it really makes a lot of sense for people who struggle with anxiety to do either something like improv or something that will put them in a state where they have their sense of humor back, for yeah. goodness sake. Yeah, and I would just to add to that, um, episode 67 of the Anxiety Podcast, I interviewed Cameron Algy, who uh, is from Toronto, but he actually runs an improv class for people with anxiety. So huh. um, he works at Second City, I think, where they have normal improv, but he also does an anxiety-specific one. And uh, yeah, so it's just night and day once people get through that initial class um and start to realize that i mean the reality of of life is this is that people probably like charlie hohen today much more than they did when they thought you were a stone cold killer um, because <laughs> because they because the, um you probably came across yeah. as across as perfect and having all your shit together and working for tim ferris and everything's perfect and then you know, now, uh, although your girlfriend doesn't like your vulnerability, I do, um, <laughs> because it gives people something to attach to, something to connect to, you know, like sitting around for, for a friend and talking for an hour is fine. But once you can break down the barriers and admit that you're struggling, it opens up the door for a much deeper relationship. And I now have the ability to connect with people, and I know you do as well, on a whole nother level um, yeah. that, that, you, that I never thought was possible before. But now, because I'm public with my story, and absolutely you are with yours, you, you attract people who want to share and say, you know, this is what's going on for me. And uh, yeah. it allows you to go much deeper, much quicker. It really does. It really does. I mean, you're, you're so right about that. And it's kind of painful to, to think about in retrospect is the old me was probably, um, insufferable and unlikable a lot of the time. And I had no self-awareness of it, Mm. but having, um, this openness, like in owning this uh, this what was I thought of as like just a weakness and uh, you know something to be ashamed of ended up being viewed as as uh, courageous by a lot of people and, and brave to to come mm-hmm. forward and say that and you know what it ended up helping out a stupid amount of people it's mm-hmm. helped out a lot of people that I I was just uh, totally caught off guard by. And, um, for, for the better for, for a lot of them, uh, I, anxiety sucks. Like mm. dealing with it is really hard. It's exhausting Oh yeah, and it's miserable and you just want it to stop. Um, and, but, like, and like you said at the start, like this isn't uh, and I always say if I was going to pick a sexy career, some crazy right. MLM scheme or something, it probably wouldn't be, uh, let's be, you know, let's be an anxiety expert or an anxiety coach or support people around that because it's, it's painful and it's difficult. But, yeah. um, at the same time, uh, when I was struggling most, my story mirrors a lot of yours. I got pills. They didn't feel right. I took them for a while and then stopped. Um, I saw a psychologist that didn't work and I was kind of looking f- for something. And that was my inspiration for starting this podcast was 
I, I was, I've always been a podcast consumer. Um, and mm -hmm. I would have loved to have heard honest, frank conversations about real struggles that I could resonate with. It's not that we right. want to be, you know, misery loves company It's that you have a, you know, you have a different life and a better life, uh, as a result of having anxiety, it's made you a better person without yeah. that, without that struggle, without something to push up against, you would still be, you know, uh, you know, trying to crush it probably Gary yeah, V but, style. You'd probably be trying yeah. to work super hard all the time and never play in and never taking time out. Oh my gosh. So what you said was just so beautiful, so important. And I think this is something that doesn't get emphasized enough. Um, well, it, it, before I, do, before I say what you said was so great, uh, I, I wanted to make a, add to what you said, which is catering to people with anxiety is, is helpful work. It's important work. And I'm glad you do it, Tim. Um, it's also really challenging because of the mental where, where people are when they come to you is only when they're like, all right, I've tried everything on my own. I'm desperate. Please help. You know, but before that they're in denial, Mm. They're, they're paranoid. They don't trust you. They don't identify with you. And so it's, it can be really challenging catering to, to people who struggle with this sometimes because they don't trust anything, uh, that seems like it could be trying to take advantage of them, you know? Mm. Um, but what you said about viewing your anxiety, being grateful because it, it helps it's, it's allowed me to, you know, help people. It's allowed you to help people. Um, I think that's, that mindset is so huge is, which is, you know, practicing on a regular basis, gratitude, even for the, t the hard things. And so I mentioned earlier in the conversation that, you know, when my girlfriend started crying, I was envious because I couldn't cry. I remember the first time I did cry mm -hmm. after that was when I did this exercise where I wrote down on a piece of paper, all the things that were frustrating me, all the things that I was struggling with, all the things that I thought were like obstacles to happiness. And I wrote them all down and it was about a full page of paper. And then I took out another piece of paper and I started writing down. Yeah. Every sentence would start with, I'm grateful for blank. You know, the thing that's stressing me out because, and then I would come up with a reason for every single one. And about halfway through, I was just, I was pouring in tears mm. because it was the first time that like, I actually looked at my life, not the first time, but it was, it was the first time in a long time that I was looking at my life through that lens of gratitude and like love and acceptance that I think is, is so, so important. I mean, it's, it's easy for somebody with anxiety who, with very deep chronic anxiety to say, uh, my parents, my parents did this, you know, they didn't love me. Their love was always in the balance growing up. You know, this is, this is deep rooted. It's something that's never going to heal. Yeah. But maybe they allowed you to connect and be super loving with others. Maybe every positive thing that's come into your life because you were such an overwhelmingly kind person uh, came about because of that. Maybe your defense mechanism growing up turned out to be your greatest gift. Mm. And maybe it's something you need to work on for, for a while. So you can, you know, be, be a better person and be the person that you want to be. Um, but there's, there's a silver lining everywhere, but you have to practice. You have to look for it. You have to practice looking for it. Yeah. And like you said, you know, a good, uh, a good, you know, a good statement you made was not everybody's ready to do the work. Um, and that's yeah. why, you know, 
people, a lot of the people I speak to at the moment, and this is one of the paradigm shifts I'm trying to make with this, with the, with the niche we, we reside in, is that most people still, and not their fault, but just the way the system works, is most people still go to the doctor, get medication. Yeah. I read something on Facebook today which said that the some pharmaceutical guy quoting that um, profits were more important than actually healing people, which really isn't a surprise. Um, right. But... Uh, uh, I mean, if you know anything about the pharmaceutical industry, uh, it, it shouldn't come like none of this should come at a su- as a surprise. I I remember being mortified and so offended uh, when I did all that research on the benzo that my mm-hmm. doctor prescribed me, yeah. and I talked to my friend, and he was like, "Yeah." You know, they're they're they want you to be on their product. Like they're they're the most profitable industry on the planet. And uh, what did you expect? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, and so you know, most people because of the way the system's built is they go to the doctor, they get the medication, they try the medication that does doesn't work for most people, and then they. You know, they eventually see a psychologist and that doesn't help. And, and so it ultimately comes down to when they're ready, they, they tend to engage in the work. But in the early, what I was going to say is in the early days of doing this, I was kind of in groups and trying to, trying to hustle and, you know, help people and do stuff. And, uh, I would come across people and say, listen, I, I know I can help you based on my experience. Um, let's have a call. Um, and they, I get them on the phone and they'd say, well, you know, I can't actually afford any coaching. I say, let's, I'll do it for free. Like I'm, I'm building my business. I'll do it for free. Uh, and they said, no, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> and I'm like, so you actually don't want the help, but you're asking for it, which was mind, yeah. mind bending to me, but it's in, in line with what you're saying. And, and ultimately, um, you know, when people are ready to, and this isn't a knock on anybody, some, you know, it's just a, a natural process people have to get through is, um, when people are ready to engage in the work and ready to get better, they'll step forward and put their hand up. Um, and that seems to, seems to be the way that it works. And one of the things that I've noticed in doing this is I believe that an underlying thing, which no doubt comes from play, no doubt comes from human interaction is that people who have anxiety have, you know, that that's the tip of the iceberg. That's the symptom. That's the output. But the reality is that somewhere along the line, we've damaged our self-confidence, our self-belief and our self-esteem. Um, and those things need to be rebuilt and they can, they can be rebuilt in, in a, in a few different ways. But one of the big shifts for me is that at some point along, and I remember the day that I was like, I don't, I actually like myself a little bit. Like I actually like myself a little bit. And I took that, uh, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I took that little grain of sand and put it in my pocket. And the next mm-hmm. day I picked up another grain of sand. And then, you know, sometime later I, I actually felt like I deserved better. And so I started mm-hmm. taking it. Good. So, what, the, what got you to that point? Do you think? Um, I think it was just a combination of telling my story, um, over and over again in terms of, to f- friends and family and anybody who would listen and, and kind of getting out there and unashamedly saying, this is what happened to me. And the path I was on, the treadmill I was on didn't work. The, the treadmill of like, make more money, get a bigger house, get another car, get a holiday home, get a pay rise, get newer business cards. It's like a <laughs> friggin' scene out of American yeah. Psycho, you know? I, that's what I was trying to do. I wanted the gold embossed, thicker stock business card. Um, but behind it all was just, a, it was like, a total hollow existence, which I didn't believe in and had no meaning for me. So I think coming out of that, um, people say they're not affected by marketing, mm. but how many millions of people (laughs) follow that path? Yeah. That was just made up. Yeah. I mean, and I, I I think in your Ted talk, you talk about this where you're like, why does, you know, or one of my questions as a result of watching your Ted talk was like, why do so many people do jobs they hate? Yeah. Because there's more people hate their jobs than love them, for sure. Right. Um, yeah. And, and that's totally in line with, like, you know, you, t- you take a child and put them in a s- school system where you, which kind of takes away their imagination and their creativeness and make them sit there for hours of the day and follow specific guidelines. And it's like, well, yeah. do you wonder why they don't play as much? Right. It's kind of exactly. Difficult. I mean, it, they're, 
when you raise children to be focused on proving themselves rather than being themselves, Mm. of course they're going to grow up into dysfunctional adults. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And I just saw a, a tweet yesterday from, uh, Dr. Kelly Brogan, who's somebody I've quoted on the podcast before, because she's quite pro the holistic approach to depression, anxiety, and, and other things. And, and her quote says that um, many a patient has felt relief for being told they have a chemical imbalance. A chemical imbalance, by definition, is not your fault. In fact, there's nothing you can do about it except, of course, to fill your prescription and take it forever like a good patient. Um, oh, that's good. So, yeah, great quote, but it made me think like, you know, all of the stuff which uh, when it, all of the people I've come across who have overcome anxiety are really ones where they've grabbed the bull by the horns and said, I'm going to change my life. Could be in a small way, could be in a huge way, but change exactly. needs to be made. Exactly. Like this is, I mean, what you're talking about nails it is people who think that they don't have anything within their control, that they're just at the mercy of chemicals and, and stuff that, that that they can't influence are totally wrong. Like objectively, scientifically proven, they're wrong. Mm. You have influence. And even if you didn't, why would you just lay back and say, well, that's just the, those are just the cards I've been handed. Mm. Right? Like, how many people during the great depression had three jobs or started multi-million dollar companies? There were a lot, there were a lot. Yeah. And the people who blamed the economy mentally checked out. It's like that. Um, I mean, it's for people who say I can't afford something. Why don't you say, how can I afford something? Like, mm. why do you give yourself the excuse to quit? It's the same. It's the exact same principle in everything in life is, is your mindset. And this goes back to play actually is when you deprive people of play, they for, they consistently report. And this has been through surveys since the 1960s. Uh, they consistently report that they feel that they have less control over their life. So this is, um, you know, Peter Gray's research was they surveyed kids uh, ever since the 1960s asking them a series of questions, and they found the correlation uh, between play deprivation and, like, these mental disorders. And one of the, the effects is they say, I don't feel like I have control over my life. Mm. So you need play just for that to remind yourself that you do have control because that's a side effect. That's a positive side effect of play. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you just got me thinking about something. I go to some of these entrepreneurial events, um, like you do, no doubt. Um, but I'm sure there's no, 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 <laughs> used to um but you know what you know the kind i'm talking about but you go there and you pay you know a lot of money to go and then what do they get you to do they get you to play because in your normal life you don't necessarily have permission to go and you know drive atvs and play tennis and play games of golf you know um and meanwhile your family thinks you're off learning some new business tactic but you're actually um you know, on the shooting range or having some fun or something, but it, whether you, uh, whether you're into those types of things or not, it's, it's just an interest in reality that people pay a lot of money to take a break from their life, to go and do something which they could be doing anyway, in terms of from a play point of view, right? Totally. It's like, it's like we're asking for permission to do what comes naturally, which is kind of weird. You know, what's hilarious is I have a friend who is one of the most, you know, successful entrepreneurs I know, you know, like he sold multiple companies. He sold his last one for a hundred million dollars. He, his current company just went public. Like he's incredible. Um, he like almost begged me to put on a retreat for, for him and people like him. That was just like, just teach us how to play, like just have it be, um, you know, 
have have a few hours of like business talk and stuff mm. and then have the rest just be like teaching us how to keep play in our life. Yeah. So why don't you do that? That sounds like fun. I, mean, I want to <laughs> do it. I'm, I'm going to do it after I uh, kind of wrap up this other stuff. Have because, some yeah. obscure, have some obscure fun. You know, I, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm at my parents' house at the moment. I played table tennis with my dad this morning. It was so fun. Yeah. Um, with my kids yesterday, we were doing a, I don't know what you call it in different parts of the world, but like a kick up competition. So see how many times yeah. you can kick a soccer ball up without it touching the ground, like stuff like that. Not doesn't have to be like the traditional, let's have a game of golf or let's play uh, right. organized sport. It can just be stupid things, but they sometimes you the know, funnest. Yeah, I, I agree. One of my favorite games is just called ball. And what you do <laughs> is you take like a, uh, you know, like a beach ball or something and you have a big group of people and you just hit it up in the air and you see how many times you can keep it in the air. It doesn't have to be a beach ball. It mm. can be a tee ball. It can be any type of ball. And uh, it's, it's still very, very fun as an adult. Yeah. You mentioned your, your successful friend. So why is it that entrepreneurial types um, still seem to see it as a badge of honor to, uh, try and kill it or crush it or whatever term you want to use? I think it's a good question. It's one that I've thought about a lot. Um, and I think a par- a big part of it goes back to, um, you know, what, what we were talking about earlier, you raise kids in an environment where they're constantly having to prove themselves um, they're going to grow up to be those types of people. The ones who are successful at it mm-hmm. will will grow up to to continue that behavior of continually working, working, working. Um, I think with with um, entrepreneurs in particular, um, the, it, it's kind of like they've no matter what industry you're in, you kind of speak that lang- the language of that industry. You kind of fall into the, the cultural norms of that industry. Right. And unfortunately for entrepreneurs, especially like in Silicon Valley, uh, they, they have a lot of money on the line. Usually um, all of them will push themselves to their physical limit. And, and you said the big one, they'll deprive themselves of sleep. Mm. Uh, 5 a.m. club let's go right they'll really cut corners on sleep and it's really unfortunate because that pretty much guaranteed to lead to an early death you know i feel that's that's one of the most the, the things i'm most grateful for is recognizing that if i kept depriving myself of sleep the way i was i was marching toward an early grave you know there are businessmen who hop off the treadmill at 5 a.m. after running intensely for a half hour and only getting four hours of sleep and going straight back to work. These guys die of heart attacks at 55, you know, like it's that plus the social isolating aspect of being able to work on your laptop all day long. I think for, Mm. for a lot of up and coming entrepreneurs, like, you don't necessarily need, I mean, the guy who started plenty of fish.com, that's a huge website. He did it all by himself. Like he's, he's very reclusive. Yeah. Um, and so it just kind of the nature of that is like, if, if you are in that category, you really do have to go out of your way to maintain a healthy social life, a vibrant social life uh, with, that's rooted in, you know, if you're a guy, you have a brotherhood of friends. If you're a woman, you have a sisterhood of, of close female friends that you can fall back on that keep you grounded and that you can be emotionally vulnerable around. Um, mm. Otherwise, you, you, can, you can spin off the rails very, very easily if you, if you isolate yourself. And certainly your health deteriorates. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the other thing I've come to learn with working for myself is nobody necessarily tells you when to stop. It's not like five o'clock and people start leaving. And if you work really hard, then 
maybe you stay an extra an hour and finish at six. When you work from home and work on your own, you can feasibly work forever. Um, yeah. And actually, uh, our, our friend in common, Jason Cannell, I'll put a link mm-hmm. to this in the show notes, but he, uh, he just wrote an article on his blog about, he called it the truth about entrepreneurship, but he talks about how entrepreneurship isn't for everybody. And actually some people would do better with a job. And some people who are entrepreneurs are actually envious of people who have jobs because they can just go and get it done and go home. Yeah. You know? It's absolutely true. What so? What was it like? Uh, you, you probably bored of talking about this, but uh, what was it like working for Tim Ferriss? Because there's there's a little bit of irony in the fact that he wrote the Four Hour Work Week, and I know I've heard him talk about this, and he says like I've never actually I don't actually work four hours. I was just showing it was possible essentially. Um, right. <laughs> but uh, but you burnt out as a result of working uh, on that kind of stuff. So what was that like? Um. Well. So there's, there's a few things. Well, well, for one, it was my dream job, right? So, um, it was, it was literally my dream job and Mm -hmm. I busted my ass to get myself into that position. Um, two, I don't like it was, it would have been really easy for me to kind of like vilify Tim and say, Oh, he just drove me into the ground. That wasn't true. Mm-hmm. I went to another job and I did the exact same thing. Yeah. You know, like he, he certainly pushed me to like be better. And, and, but I also one I had to learn the hard way that I didn't have certain boundaries for myself, you know, yeah. like I, I would sacrifice myself at the altar of work over and over and over, mm-hmm. you know? So it wasn't, it wasn't Tim that drove me into that condition Um, it was, it was, I, I, again, it was like, I take full responsibility for, for, for whatever happened to me and all anxious people should do the same. You know, you can't point the finger at somebody else. Um, working with Tim to answer your question was incredible. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity and it was, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, but it was also like the, the highest reward, you know, um, Mm -hmm. you got to write a book, uh, not write a book. I got to help him edit a book, uh, and launch it that changed thousands of people's lives and made them healthier, Mm -hmm. you know, the four hour body. Um, I got to co-host an event, uh, or I'm sorry, I got to plan an event uh, that a four day event for 130 amazing entrepreneurs that he hosted. And I got to co-plan it with uh, who's now a good friend of mine, Susan Dupre, who she, she worked for years for Steve jobs and, and James Cameron. And uh, like, she's one of the top event planners in the world. I met so many amazing people through Tim um, that changed my life because mm-hmm. they showed, I grew up in Colorado, uh, and I didn't have any entrepreneurial friends growing up at all. You know, I, I thought I was a weirdo mm-hmm. for, you know, inventing things and, and creating things and wanting to figure out how to turn them into businesses. And, you know, in, in college, I was getting up early to call, uh, you know, distributors in, on the East coast and trying to reach through, you know, for ideas that I, that I'd had and, um, and volunteering at, uh, you know, entrepreneurial contests and, and stuff to, to just keep time. So I could sit behind doors and, and listen to the investors talk it out. And, um, you know, so I was, I, I getting to work with Tim was my ultimate dream come true. And my only wish, my only regret was that I'd had better boundaries for myself because we would probably still be, we would probably would have worked together for a long time after. Mm. Uh, and I, I mean, he and I worked really well together. We got a lot of stuff done. We complimented each other extremely well. And, um, you know, it, I, I, I felt bad and how things turned out because at the time when I quit, um, 
I wasn't ready to be fully honest with how I felt uh, because I didn't understand it, you know? So mm-hmm. it kind of hit, kind of came out of the blue, man. You know, like I, I've had to learn from, from therapy, from, um, you know, reading a bunch of books that, um, you know, what happened with Tim wasn't this isolated incident because of the fact that he's super famous it gets more attention. Yeah. But I've had these blowout type of relationships where all of a sudden I pull out and the other person's like, what the hell where yeah. did that come from? You know, were you aware, um, when you left, were you aware of his issues with, um, considering suicide when he was in college? Yeah, I think we talked about that. And, you know, one of the reasons I part of the reasons why I I left when I did was because I felt I had a legitimate excuse to, you know, it wasn't even like I wasn't even like Tim. I need to quit for my own health. It was Tim. One of the people in my life who who's very close to me attempted suicide. Um, That was like one of the one of the reasons. So, um, you know, he, he and I have talked about it at length and he was actually, you know, he asked me to, to offer my input on that post and, and to, um, you know, draft up something if, if I had anything I wanted to add to it. Mm. Um, so both he and I understand we have, we certainly have different emotional issues and certain, you know, um, you know, ways that our anxiety and stuff manifests and how we, how we deal with it. But both of us have an appreciation and respect for each other in, in, in that topic in particular. Yeah. I I guess I only asked because I, from the point of view of you feeling comfortable enough to share the truth based on the fact of knowing that he would be open to it. I don't yeah, I don't know if at that time, I don't know. It, it, I mean, it comes down to me again. Mm. You know, I I, I I come across plenty of stories of people, you know, being open and honest and vulnerable. But until you actually start practicing it for mm. yourself, oh yeah, you know, you, you don't you don't know. You mm. know, it's like you can't. You just got to do it. Yeah. So. Uh, one question I did want to ask you was, cause I know you, you, you speak to younger people, um, fairly regularly about business and, and getting into business. What would you say to a, I mean, I, I guess it's a two part question. What would you say to a, the, the 20 year old Charlie Ho and who was in the middle of that? And, and also what would you say to a, just a 20 year old entrepreneur who's starting out today about how to create some balance or some boundaries? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm t- I- I don't really regret anything. Uh, so there's nothing I I can really say apart from, I, I think everyone should plan their life around friendship. Mm. Um, because friends are really around deep friendship. Um, and, and commit to those friendships that matter to you because friends are really where your your most true self friends are where you're at your kindest, where you're at your sweetest, your most giving, and they will prevent you from getting stressed out. They'll prevent you from getting sick. Um, they'll keep you happy. You'll have more fun. Friendship to me is, is the greatest gift that life has to offer. And I think my early 20 year old self didn't realize that how, what he was missing was neglecting those friendships. And the irony, right? Is that my friends were super supportive of, of what I was doing. So was my family. Everyone was cheering for me. Um, and so I kind of took my eyes off of them and I think that's really my only kind of thing that I still will feel bad about every now and then and still kind of regret is, man, I could have, I could have really, uh, you know, done a better job 
of, of keeping in touch with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, uh, I'd, I'd totally feel you from that point of view, because I think we in, on the, on the treadmill of achievement in life, we strive for this to, to make a massively complicated life of owning things and being things and trying to be perceived certain ways. And in my experience, anyway, the things which actually make me feel fantastic, nourish me and make me feel loved are exceptional relationships simple things like good food and nice cup of tea. Like th it's the basics, which we gravitate towards. Um, and I say this bloody quote all the time. So I apologize to my lovely listeners, but what you own owns you. So, and, and that's both from a mental and physical point of view, great quote from the movie fight club. But if you have all this stuff to maintain, which could be jobs and careers and relationships and houses and car, like there's overhead there. And so mm -hmm. in my life anyway, and I'm a budding minimalist, the, the simpler it gets, the lighter I feel. So be careful mm -hmm. how much stuff, you know, uh, for, for people listening, be careful how much stuff you're chasing after on the old treadmill of life, because once you get it all, you'll probably find you don't want it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. There's a, um, I think it was Jim Carrey who said, I, I wish everyone would get every single thing that they ever wanted mm -hmm. because they would realize that it doesn't make them happy. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of not, I, I, I feel like there's a collective awakening that's beginning to happen with that stuff. Um, and certainly, you know, tons of movies have covered the topic. Uh, you mentioned fight club, American beauty and stuff like that. But I think more and more people, as we become more and more materially rich, uh, in the West are recognizing that there's a severe imbalance there. And I think in the East they're materially poor, but spiritually rich. Mm. And, uh, so I think. Hopefully, you know, we work on the balance of being spiritually rich as well. Yeah. I mean, trust me, I've I've gone from uh chasing that dream to uh as I joked with you before we started recording, I'm I've moved back in with my mum and dad at thirty eight, but uh mm -hmm. just for a period of time. But I mean, you know, that's uh that's a, a choice I made to to not have to uh you know, to have all those trappings and, and be able to travel and kind of be a bit more mobile, you know? And, and you uh, know, you know, what's great about that is like, even though that's f for where, where are you based today? I'm in uh, England. Yeah. In England, it's probably culturally, you know, irregular. Right. Um, but in a lot of the healthiest cultures, like in terms of socially healthy and emotionally healthy families live together. Hmm. You no, know, it's, it's not, you have a kid and they disappear forever. Yeah. Yeah. And we get to hang out here for a few months. We're not going to, we're not here for ages, but we're going to be here for right. a few months. My parents get to spend more time with their grandkids. I get to have a bit of a, a break because we just get some more support. So why not? I mean, it makes so much sense in the world instead of being all isolated in our little boxes and doing our own things. And, um, you know, I don't, if you said to me, Hey Tim, I'm starting a new company which you'd be great for. We'll pay you five million dollars a year, but you have to be in these countries on these dates. And I'd, I'd say no, I'm actually all right. Yeah, because it's it, it, as you said, it's not just about money. Once you've and, and it's unfortunate that human nature dictates that we have to taste it before we realize we don't actually want it. Um, but for sure, that as the Jim Carrey thing goes, and as you see people who win the lottery and then end up not having the money again a few years down the line. It's, it's not yeah. the answer to all our problems. It really is not. Can't buy time. Nope. So I would like to just conclude, um, by saying that, you know, Charlie has written, uh, a very popular book called play it away, a workaholics cure for anxiety. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And, uh, for people listening, I'd recommend you grab a copy. And, uh, in that book, Charlie goes into more detail about, a variety of the different th important components of, of your recovery ultimately. Um, and also a lot more detail about the play, the play element itself. Um, but I, I guess, you know, I'd ask you to clarify, but we don't really want to overcomplicate it. Play can include all sorts of things, right? Totally. I, 
it, it can include a ton of stuff. I mean, Pokemon Go, I think, is actually a better form of, uh, you know, relieving anxiety than most exercises. It's better than hopping on the treadmill. I think it's better than doing yoga um, because play, these are kind of the criteria I look for with play. It's guilt-free fun or you're not really worrying while you're doing it. There's social bonding happening, so you can do it with friends. Uh, it's physically active, ideally, uh, which doesn't have to mean rigorous. It just has to be moving around. Uh, it can put you in a flow state, so it can be mentally stimulating enough that you feel immersed in the present, and it brings about joy and laughter. And ideally, you're, you're out in the sun, you're in fresh air, and it's self-directed. You go at your own pace. You're doing it. You're not being instructed. No one's telling you what to do. You're just going where you want to go. Mm. And Pokemon Go hits all of those. Hits all of those. And um, I mean, if you if you look up Pokemon Go in mental health, you're going to see tons of people being saying stuff along the lines of. Wow, Pokemon Go has already been a better treatment for my depression and anxiety than anything my doctor prescribed or therapist recommended because it's true play. And yeah. um, I, I talk about um, in, the, in the book, I, I list off a bunch of activities that are uh, great activities for play. Um, if, if people don't want to read the book or they just prefer another medium, um, I, I have YouTube videos under the YouTube account, Play It Away, that you can check out as well. Yeah, and I'll link to those. I actually watched those again today, but I'll link to those in the show notes and they give, I think each of the videos is, is you know, th- three minutes or so. So we could watch those six videos and in 20 minutes have, yeah. some, have some great stuff to get moving with. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Charlie, thanks very much for coming on today. I've loved the conversation. Um, It's been great talking to you, and it was worth waiting for. Absolutely. Tim, thank you so much for having me, man, and uh, would, would be happy to be back anytime. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, Charlie. So there you have it. That was Charlie Hone. Um, talking about playing it away. I really enjoyed the, the conversation today. And I think there's just so much fun and so much lightness that we can bring into our lives to have a bit more enjoyment, you know, and take the, the serious edge off of battling anxiety all the time. We just need to get out there and, you know, play catch, play tennis, throw a frisbee, throw a ball for your dog, um, just have some fun. Remember what it was like to be a child again, skip and, and just do fun stuff. I recently went on a, a family trip where we booked into this place and it was just all the different sports you can try. And it was fun just getting back into things that I hadn't done for years. Um, and I'm usually the first one when I take my kids swimming to, uh, to throw myself down the water slide uh, as quickly as I can. So it's definitely fun to get out there and try new things. Um, I'd love to hear what you guys get up to in terms of play. So if you do anything novel or exciting or whatever you do, send me an email and let me know what you've got up to so I can kind of add it to my list of things to suggest for people. That'd be fantastic. If you have any guest suggestions, suggestions, um, or show suggestions, please feel free to send me a message. Go to the contact page. I'm constantly looking for high quality people who can just add value to you, the audience, add value and enrich your lives and, and give you things to consider in your journey in terms of overcoming anxiety. If you'd also like to get a bit more involved in the conversation, you can go to the front page at anxietypodcast.com and click the button to join the Facebook group where you can then kind of have this ongoing conversation in between episodes, get some feedback on stuff that's going on for you and uh, just get to know a few other people. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.